Is that hey Melissa, are you recording this? Anyway, the Rich Thule is one of those poems that speaks about how this is going to come to fruition. And I know that it's an ancient poem and there are some interesting ideas about it, but I want to start with something I, I heard from a school teacher today. It says, when I look around our classroom, I couldn't tell you who crawled first, who walked before one or spoken sentences before 15 months. I can't tell you if their parents breastfed or bottle fed. No clue if they still wear pull-ups at night because I'm sure many do. I don't know if they are potty trained at 18 months or four years old. I don't know if their mom ever left them to cry, cried out for a few minutes, or if they strapped them to their bodies 24 seven. You know what I can tell when I look at all my kids? I can tell which families value kindness and manners in their homes. I can tell when a child feels loved and secure at home and at school, which sadly isn't always everyone's school experience. I know who has pizza and movie Friday nights and which mom reads different voices for bedtime. I see how kids handle scary situations like thunderstorms. I can see who has a solid routine at home, who has chores and responsibilities. I can hear how you speak to your child by how they speak to others. And when I look at my little friends, I don't see their milestones. I see who they are, their heart, their actions, their inner voice, their struggles and triumphs. And I see you and all the love you pour into them. We are always supposed to talk about testing and benchmarks and data during parent-teacher conference. And I had a mom last time look at me and say, I don't worry about all the reading and math. She will get there. I want to know how is she as a person? Is she kind? And does she include others? That's from a teacher, and, and I found it very interesting that that showed up today as I'm fixing to go over the Rick Thula, and it talks very succinctly and very clearly about how we should raise children. It talks about how we should build our future. It talks about the mindset we should adopt and what we must look for as the hallmarks to where we want to go in this world. And it starts, and, the, and there are no other poems I, that I can think of, no other lays that come close to pointing this out. And they tell in old stories that one of the gods, whose name was Heimdall, went on his way along a certain seashore and came to a dwelling where he called himself Rig. Rig is a, is a Celta, is an old Irish word for king. According to these stories is the following poem. Men say there went by ways so green of the old, the god, the aged and wise, mighty and strong did Rig go striding. The king went for a walk. Forward he went on the midmost way. He came to a dwelling, a door on its posts. In did he fare, on the floor was a fire. Two hoary ones by the hearth there set, I and Edda in their olden dress. I and Edda are great grandmother and great grandfather. And hoary simply means ancient or old or whitened with age. It's, uh, it's a very old term that comes from the oldest reference we have of it is from the uh, Beowulf in the 12th century. But you gotta think about what that dwelling looks like. You have two ancient old people sitting there. They have a floor, probably dirt, and there's a fire in the middle of the floor. No fireplace, no finery, a door on its post. And that's it, that's all they say. You have these two old people sitting there. Rig knew well wise words to speak. Soon in the midst of the room he sat and on either side the others were. They welcomed him in, they showed him hospitality, and next thing you know, he's sitting there. So you have this ancient couple sitting there with the very basic necessities of life, living hand to mouth, and when the divine showed up at their door, they invited him in. So you have this very ancient couple that brings the divine into their home. A loaf of bread did Etta bring, heavy and thick and swollen with husks, so it's not very refined. You haven't separated the wheat from the chaff, it's a very grainy bread. Forth on the table she set the fare, and broth for the meal in a bowl there was. Calf's flesh boiled was the best of dainties. So it's a very simple meal in a simple home with elderly people, it seems like, old people, ancient people. Rig knew well wise words to speak. Thence did he rise, made ready to sleep. Soon in the bed himself did he lay, and on either side the others were. And that is one of those phrases or stanzas that always confuses people. Now this is not a representation of some kind of kinky three-way. 
this is an acceptance of the divine into the most intimate aspects of a couple's relationship. Something very holy enters into their relationship as they enjoy each other's company at night. Now this brings forth a child. Thus he was there for three long, three nights long. And then forward he went on the midmost way, the earth, Midgard. And so nine months were soon passed. So that, that holy night, that night of the honeymoon, that night when the most joyous occasion of a couple to be, be joined together, nine months later a child is born. Well, they've got this divine idea in their hearts. And when they bear their son into the world, they, a son bore Edda with water they sprinkled him. With a cloth his hair so black they covered, thrall they named him. His skin was wrinkled and rough on his hands, knotted his knuckles, thick his fingers, and ugly his face. His face twisted his back and big his heels. So this is something that this couple that have accepted the divine into their relationship, and they give birth to a son. So this very simple race. Now this is where the Theodish brought in the classes of men. This is where Dumazel makes his argument of the three stages of man and three classes of men the worker, the warrior, and the king or the priest. And at that time when it was written, this very well may have been the case. This very well may have been exactly what it means. But today's age, as I will get to, we've got a different kind of thing going on here. This very ancient tale has a representation and a truth to it that resonates in a modern day society that people like Dumazel never envisioned when he put it together or could not envision when he put it together. But this simple man, the black hair, they covered it with a cloth, he didn't really fit in, he was simple and rough, he was an apprentice, he was just learning something, he was the first worker in the field. He is the base existence, the base condition of an individual who begins a journey through life, uncultured, uneducated, and simple. He may be strong of back, but he doesn't have a sharp mind with which to apply what he's talking about. He began to grow and to gain his strength. Soon of his might, good use he made. Every time a man starts a job, he starts off strong. He wants to do the best he can. And this is kind of where this man is at. He is also a representation of young men as they enter the world. With, with bass, he bound and burdens carried. Home bore faggots the whole day long. And these great loads of firewood to keep the hearth keep the hearth warm, to keep the fire burning in the hearth. But one came to their home, crooked her legs, stained were her feet, and sunburned her arms. Flat was her nose. Her name was Thier. Soon in the midst of the room she sat, and by her side there sat the son of the house. They whispered both, and the bed made ready, thrall and Thier till the day was through. This young couple this very base existence. In olden times, it was the simple servant folk who would get together. But if you're paying attention to what's being read here, even if they were the simple thrall or the servant class of that time, the same kind of attention to detail, the specialness with which love is attended, the ceremony with which these two couples should also join in that bed where the divine was accepted into the relationship to begin with, there's a formality to it. And the same thing occurs with us as well. But this is where the real special part happens. Because their children, the divine has been accepted into their parents, the formality has been repeated in the child and his new bride, and now the grandchildren come along. Children they had, they lived, they, they lived and were happy. Something very special is taking place as this repeated ceremony of divine, of acceptance of the divine, the formality of these relationships and the, and the development of men, of boys into men and girls into women, there's something very special happening here. Fjallsnir and Klur, they were called, methinks. Prime, Klegi, Kefsir, Fulnir, Drum, Degraldi, Draught, Legyaldi, Lut, and Hosvir. The house they cared for, ground they dung, swine they guarded, goats they tended, and turf they dug. They were farmers. They handled the business of running a farm. But their names are important. Fosnir means cattleman. Clear means the course. Prime means the shouter. Plaguey, the horsefly. Kefsir, the concombine keeper. 
Fulnir, the stinking, Drum, the log, DeGraldi, the fat, Drought, the sluggard, Legaldi, the big legged, Lute, the bent, Osvir, the gray. Daughters they had, Drumba and Kumba, Alkfin Kalfa, Arenifla, I can't pronounce that, Yishya, Ambat, Ainkin Yasna, Totru Grifya, Tronabiena, and thence has risen the race of thralls. So there you call it, the race of thralls. But what do their names mean? Drumba means the log, Kumba the stumpy, Okvin Kalfa the fat legged, Arinfla the homely nosed, Yishnya the noisy, Ambat the servant, Ankinyasna the oaken peg, Totru Grifya the clothed in rags, Tronabiena the crane legged. So these are simple people. This is the Walmart crowd, for lack of a better word. Okay, these are the people that you're going to take pictures of in Walmart, but they're still here with us today. But they're not consigned to be thralls in this day and age, though we still want to regard this tale as something very special and relevant to our faith. Forward went Rig, his road was straight, to a hall he came, and a door there hung. So the door's no longer on post. They're not living a simple life. This door actually hung on hinges. In did he fare, on the floor was a fire. Afi and Amma owned the house. Afi and Amma mean grandma and grandfather and grandma. There sat the twain and worked at their tasks. The man hewed wood for the weaver's beam. His beard was trimmed over his brow a curl. His clothes fitted close in the corner a chest. So this next generation, and it may have been a thousand years between these visits. It doesn't necessarily mean he went house to house to house. So from the great grandmother and grandfather and their simple lives and the children they bring into the world and their grandchildren, these simple working folk, kind of like the coal miners of West Virginia or the cowboys out West or your regular folk working in the steel mill the simple people working their day-to-day -day jobs, but they have no aspiration to become something better. So how do you take this group of people who've been given the gifts of good sense and goodly hue and color and soul, how do you push that forward to want to cultivate these gifts and sharpen them into the instruments that create civilizations? While you encourage them to accept the divine into their home and see what becomes of that. Impress upon them the importance of the formality of what happens when the divine is accepted into your home and that your children remain respective of that formality to see where their children go. And we already see that the grandchildren of that first couple, well, they become very good at what they're doing. They become, their names represent the success with which they have indulged in their endeavors. Now, second, generation is coming along. It's no longer great-grandmother and great-grandfather. Now it's grandmother and grandfather. We have a generational idea too. Now, the man worked at tasks. He hewed wood for the weaver's beam, so he was skilled. He had a craft. He was a wood carver. His beard was trimmed, and over his brow curled, he was a cleanliness become part of his, part of his routine. Now he was decent to present. His clothes fitted close and in the corner a chest. Now there's a piece of furniture with which they might hold their treasured belongings and his clothes fitted close. That means there was some skill with regards to uh, what he was wearing, how it was made. Things are beginning to develop here, but there should be something more to that. There sat the twain and worked at their tasks. Or the woman sat and the distaff welded. She's pulling yarn. At the weaving with arms outstretched she work. On her head was a band, on her breast a smock, and on her shoulders a kerchief with clasps that were. So she has some nice clothes. She has clothes suitable for the work she does. She's got the skill necessary to make these. So the lot of this couple, this second generation, appears to be much better than the lot of that first generation, which may very well have been Neanderthal-like people. Now we have this cultivated individual, and they're also going to accept the divine into their home. 
Rick knew well wise words to speak. Soon in the midst of the room, he sat, and on either side, the others were. So these wise words he's speaking, what do you reckon they might represent? Do you think he's pointing out their flaws, or do you think he's giving them a reason to want to accept the divine into their home? Do you think he's reinforcing the ideas that makes people say, hey, I want some of that in my home. I want this faith to help me create a wonderful life for my children and to see that continue on to my grandchildren. Then took Amma, Grandma, the vessels full with the fare she said. Calf's flesh boiled was the best of dainties. Now they're being served that, not just the broth. Rig knew well wise words to speak. He rose from the board, made ready to sleep. Soon in the bed himself to delay on either side the other's work. Thus he was there for three nights long. Then forward he went on the midmost way, and so nine months were soon passed. So the ceremony begins again. This couple celebrates the union of themselves with the divine, and now something special is beginning to happen. A son bore Amal. With water they sprinkled him. That wonderful rune of Laguz, the interconnectedness of all things. Whatever consists of life and is living on this planet is made up of, majority of it is water. There is water, there's some kind of water-like substance in every cell of every living object. So now they have borne this son with this acceptance of the divine and holy into their marriage, and the first thing they do is sprinkle him with water and make sure he understands the connectedness of all things. They present him to the world, they connect him to the environment and the world in which he lives. Something very special about the formality of that act. Carl, they named him, in a cloth that she wrapped him, he was ruddy of faith, face and flashing his eyes. <laughs> so he's a little bit better off than that first Neanderthal-like creature. This is a man. This is a Carl, a Jarl. He began to grow and to gain in strength. Oxen he ruled and plows made ready. So now he's got his beasts working for him. Now he's got the plows made ready. Houses he built and barns he fashioned. So he's taken his father's skill at carving wood and taking it one step further into building and a civilization, a community, a town. He is an integral part of what it is. Carts he made and the plow he managed. The plow makes it easier for us to grow food. The carts allow us to transport things. Now civilization's beginning to grow. Now things are beginning to develop. Home did they bring their bride for Carl? In goat skins clad and keys she bore. Now we begin to see the formality of the responsibility of when a husband takes the keys for a woman's home. He now has a responsibility, and this is the this is our representation of it. Snore was her name, which means the new bride or something along those lines. Neath the veil she set, a ever greater importance of the formality of creating a relationship centered around faith and the divine. There is a there's a veil there. Okay, a home they made ready and rings exchanged. The exchanging of rings is very much an ancient heathen tradition from Northern Europe. The, the bed they decked and a dwelling made. Sons they had, they lived and were happy. Okay, hall and dring, hloth, thegan and smith, brythe and bondi, bundeskegi, boy and bodi, bratskeg and seg. Okay, the word, the social status of snore, daughter-in-law, uh, bring, the word literally means drove in a wagon. So this reminds us of Tacitus as they carried the goddess through all of the villages to the lake. So this daughter-in-law, the, the, the importance of the formality of what just happened in that last stanza begins to take on a newfound relevance in our thought process, or at least it should be. Because all of a sudden, in a very short time, we've come a long way from sitting on a dirt floor around a fire. Now all of a sudden, there's something very special happening, and it's something that is more familiar to us than the far past of our great-grandmother and our grandfather. Many of us can't even begin to imagine what it would be like, my great-grandmother and grandfather came across Oklahoma in a covered wagon to head to South Texas to build a railroad, then became a foreman on a ranch. And his son did something. Now, all of a sudden, what we're looking at is looking more like something we might understand. 
Hall means man. Drang means the strong. Hloth, the holder of land. So now he's got position. Now they're part of the community. Now they pay taxes. Thing means free man. Smith is a craftsman. Breith means the broad-shouldered. Bondi, the yeoman. Bundeskegi, with beard bound. Not allowed to hang unkempt. Bui, the dwelling owner. Bodhi, the farm handler. Brotskeg, with beard carried high. And Seg means man. So now all of a sudden, their names don't represent what they can do. They represent the position of what they are in the community. The owner of land, the craftsman, uh, the strong, the free man, the yellowman. But that isn't that. But that's not all. Daughters they had, and their names are here: Snote, Ruth, Zvana, Zvari, Sprocky, Fjolth, Sprond, and Vif, Fima, and Ristil. And then says, "Risen the yellowman's race." Those men that are the working part of the community, but they've gone a long way past just being the simple, almost caveman-like aspects we saw with great-grandmother and grandfather. Snote means the worthy woman. Ruth is the bride. Zvani, the slender. Zvari, the proud. Sprocky, the fair. Fjolf, woman. Sprund is the proud. Vif is the wife. Fiema, the bashful. Ristil, the graceful. Now there is elegance that comes with these beautiful daughters. So the grandmother and grandfather accepted the divine into their home. Their son became a Jarl, a chieftain of his tribe. And his sons and daughters became very much worthy aspects of the community that made it strong and beautiful. And all of those things we want to expect from living a life of also true, that we might have communities of good, strong, skilled men and beautiful women, all of those wonderful, very romantic ideals you see most fully fleshed out with uh, some of Wagner's work. <laughs> Thence went Rig, his road was straight. So now he's not wandering along shoreline. Now he has a straight road, a sign of civilization, a sign that the great gifts that Odin, Vili, and Ve bestowed upon mankind are now being sharpened to their best use. A hall he saw, the doors faced south, meaning the sun was always shining on it. You have a warm south-facing wind in the cold winter, you might be able to open the door and air it out. It will always be warm on a south-facing door, much like the great barrows, the burial mounds when they face south to the sun-facing goddess. The portal stood wide, on the post was a ring, then in he fared, okay, in the Halvamal, it talks about hanging a ring on the door so they might knock, because if you don't, everyone's going to want to come into the nice place. So you're going to hang a knocker on the door. But it also means there's some money involved. There's some skill involved. There's some position and respect involved that not everyone just gets to walk on in. Within two gazed, within two gazed in each other's eyes. These two were very much in love, father and mother, and played with their fingers. They stared longingly in each other's eyes, and they held hands. There sat the house lord, and wound strings for the bow, the skill of a warrior or a hunter. Shafts he fashioned, and bows he shaped. The lady sat, at her arms she looked, she smoothed the cloth, and fitted the sleeves. Gay was her cap, on her breast were clasps. Broad was her train, of blue was her gown. These people are, are looking good. These people have some kind of success in their lives that they have the time to take care of these kind of things. She has what it takes to look and feel pretty all the time. She has what it takes to garner her husband's attention at all times, and they look at each other's eyes longingly and with love. That's a nice little setting. That's a nice little kind of setup there. Okay? Her brows were bright, her breast was shining, whiter her neck than new fallen snow. She has what it takes to take care of herself. He is winding bowstrings to make sure that the environment his wife lives in allows her to express the beauty of who she is. Rig knew well wise words to speak, and soon in the midst of the room he sat, on either side the others were. 
Then mother brought a broidered, a broidered cloth, something very, takes a lot of skill, a broidered cloth. There's a covering on the table now of linen bright and the board she covered, a tablecloth. And then she took the loaves so thin. This is grain and flour that's been, that's, that's had the chaff separated from the wheat. And now they have fine bread to eat and laying them white from the wheat on the cloth. Mm -hmm. Then forth she brought the vessels full, a fine dinner, mm -hmm. with silver covered and set before them. Now we're talking about precious metal and skilled craftsmen, meat all brown and well-cooked birds. His hunting has yielded results. His skill has raised cattle worth eating. In the pitcher was wine, of plenty of, of plate were the cups, so that drank they and talked till the day was gone. So they feasted and drank and enjoyed each other's company. Rig knew well wise words to speak. Soon did he rise, made ready to sleep. So in the bed himself did he lay, and on either side the others were. So here we have a successful couple whose many much of their aspects is familiar to us. We live in those same kind of situations. We get to enjoy looking at, we have the time to love the people we are with. We have the strength to create environments where a woman might express the beauty of who she is. And yet there were wise words spoken, not deceitful words, not the deceivers of, men, of men's wives, but wise words that encouraged this couple to accept the divine and this faith into their home. Even with all the worldly success they have, even with all the skill and position they may have in their tribe and community, they began to set certain things aside and accept the divine and this faith into their relationship and something really beautiful happens. Thus was he there for three nights long. Then forward he went on the midmost way and so nine months were soon passed by. A son had mother. In silk they wrapped him, not just cloth, but silk. And with water they sprinkled him. Once again, they brought him into the environment in which he lives. Jarl he was, a chieftain, blonde was his hair and bright his cheeks. Grim as the snakes were his glowing eyes. An intelligent thought process behind those eyes, blonde hair, bright cheeks, he has full color and goodly hue. And he has the intelligence behind those eyes. To grow in the house did Jarl begin. Shields he brandished and bowstrings wound. Bows he shot and shafts fashioned. He learned to be a warrior from his father. Arrows he loosened and lances wielded. Horses he rode and hounds unleashed, swords he's handled and sounds he swam. He could swim, he could ride a horse. This was a skilled warrior. He picked up all of the, all of the ideas and strengths of his father and cultivated them into something that allowed him to be the Jarl, the chieftain. Straight from the grove came Rig striding. Rig came striding and runes he taught him. By his name he called him, as son he claimed him. When we began to understand our position, our ability to cultivate the gifts we have, so we might join the divine at the table. At you see Eager's Feast, you have this individual, Loki sits at the table with the divine and fails to cultivate or understand that he already has this wonderful position to be around all these divine beings. The best thing he can come up with is to humanize them, to denigrate them, to disrespect them, to throw in the face the opportunity that's been laid at his feet. And here we have an individual who has cultivated all those gifts, who has worked for, who has struggled, who has swam the sound. He has fought in wars. He has worked hard to become a warrior and earned that name of Jarl, which means nobly born. This is when the divine presents itself and says, I call you as my own. When I see people say, I stand before my gods, I always ask myself one question. What have you done to demonstrate that you have cultivated the gifts which you have, like we see Jarl do, so that you might stand in front of the gods? We've got to be asking ourselves that. If we get distracted by some idea over here or some idea over there, we are losing track of the idea of why we're even here. We will not be able to go forward on the midmost way. And that's exactly what we need to be traveling, 
forward on the midmost way to develop and cultivate these gifts we've been given again and again and again. But the important thing here is happening that makes it relevant for what we're doing today. He bade him hold his heritage wide, his heritage wide, the ancient homes. See, when we talk about the halls of our ancestors, each one of our ancestors possesses an idea of Kenaz, that room, that torch of inspiration, all the way back to the beginning. When we remember our heritage, when we remember where we come from, we have the ability to tap into all of that knowledge and truly cultivate the ideas because it travels forward in an unbroken line from the great grandmother to the grandmother to the mother. All of these things are happening. All of these generations continue to improve. They accept the divine and, into, uh, and this faith into their life. The lot of their children becomes better and their grandchildren become worthy and respectable and important aspects, component cogs in the machines, if you would. But they never forget their ancestry. To be able to tap into what we're capable of becoming, we must travel forward on that midmost way not drift over here and not drift over there, but forward on that midmost way and recognize all of the development that our ancestors had to go through for us to come to a time in this day and age when we have leisure time and we can feast in abundance and we can ponder higher spiritual ideas. Are we using that time and this effort and this place that we live in that's the fruit of all of our ancestors to cultivate those ideas of the midmost way? <laughs> forward he rode through the forest dark over the frosty crags till a hall he found. His spear he shook, his shield he brandished, his horse he spurred, with his sword he hewed, wars he raised and reddened the field, warriors slew he and land he won. Eighteen halls there long did he hold, wealth did he give, did he get and gave to all. This is a benevolent king, he fought his way to the top, become king and was benevolent to all. Stones and jewels and slim flanked steeds. Rings he offered, those rings like Odin's, the nine more, eight, eight more fall every, nine more fall every eighth night. Those are the kind of rings you give to warriors. And every time you give a ring to a warrior, there is an obligation on both sides there. And only the most successful of Jarls or Kings could continue to hand out eight more every week. He's given them out too. He has built for himself success using all of the past gifts that have been in his heritage. His messengers went by the way so wet and came to the hall where Hirsir dwelt. His daughter was fair and slender finger. Erna the wise the maiden was. Her hand they sought and home they brought her. Wedded to Jarl, the veil she wore, the formality of his heritage is still present. He actually wooed a woman. He created an environment where a woman might want to be a part of it, where she felt safe to express the beauty of who she is, and she still indulged in the formality of covering that up at that first meeting. Together they dwelt, their joy was great, children they had, and happy they lived. Burr was the eldest, and Barn the next, Hyoth and Afyal, Arfi and Mog, Nith and Zvan. Soon they began, soon and Nith young, to play and swim. Kund was one, and the youngest was Kone. Soon grew up the sons of Jarl. Beasts they tamed, and bucklers rounded, shafts they fashioned, and spears they shook. They're carrying on in their father's tradition. But Kone the young learned the runes to use. Runes everlasting, the runes of life. Heimdall the Divine has already accepted Jarl at the table of the Divine. He has already shown him the way. He knows the runes. He has conquered and created a great kingdom. He has 18 halls. He has a beautiful wife. He has powerful sons. The son, Bur, means son. Barn means child. Yoth, child. Afyal, offspring. Arfi, heir. Mog means son. Knight, descendants. Zvain, boys. Son is son. Nithyung, descendant. Kund means kinsman, and, and Kone means son of noble birth. See, there are no longer tasks or roles in the community. Now they are 
the physical representations of that heritage wide that Heimdall told him, who told him to remember. Now they're that physical representation of it, and this is a wonderful thing. Cone the Young learned the runes to use, runes everlasting, the runes of life. Soon he could well the warrior's shield, dull the sword, sword blade, and still the seas. So all of that effort his brothers have put into becoming kings and warriors and conquerors, all the youngest one learned the runes and has outdone them all. Bird chatter he learned. Flames could he lessen, minds could quiet and sorrows calm, the might and strength of twice four men. So all of that effort you put into the regular everyday activities to become as, as, as powerful as you can become, pale in comparison to what happens when you begin to understand the pattern of the runes and what they mean in your life. Cone the Young has learned something very powerful. He is next level stuff now. And there's something very important mentioned in that first line of stanza 45. Bird chatter learned he. He has learned the language of the birds, much as Sigurd learns the language of the birds. And there is the same tale, the same line in countless mythologies around the world where these heroes learn the language of the birds. See, their understanding of the language of the birds means they comprehend the flows of energy across the world. They are learning something far beyond what your average man might ever be able to perceive. The birds may not be telling them like Hugin and Moon into Odin, but they're learning how these patterns, these seasons, these flows of energy and life flow across the surface of the world. And then flames could he lessen, minds could quiet and sorrows calm. He understood how to deal with people, how to quiet the mind of the troubled man, how to, sor how to calm the sorrows of those who are in pain. And he still had the might and strength of twice four men. It takes an immense amount of spare time and liberty to cultivate those kinds of abilities to focus your mind on that midmost way, embrace your heritage and your ancestry, to understand the runes and use those abilities to help those around you. With Rig Jarl soon the runes he shared. So he goes back and teaches his father the runes. More crafty he was and greater his wisdom. The right he sought and soon he wanted Rig to be called and runes to know. Young Cone rode forth through forest and grove, shafts let loose, and birds he lured. There spake a crow on a bone that said, Why lurest thou, Cone, the birds to come? Twere better forth on thy steed to fare and host to slay. The halls of Dan and Damp are noble. Greater their wealth than thou hast gained. Good are they at guiding the keel, trying of weapons and giving of wounds. <coughs> We live in a time in an age when we have the liberty, the freedom, and the spare time to cultivate our understanding of the runes and where we might go from here. This tale, and while it may support Dumazel's time and his ideas of the past of the thrall and the warrior and the nobleman or priest, we live in a day and an age when we have at our fingertips the entirety of the world's knowledge in a device on our phone, in our hands. Anything that's ever been known or something you want to know, we used to share cat memes. But this individual, Rig Carl, soon the runes he shared, more crafty he was and greater his wisdom, the right he sought and soon he wanted, Rig to be called and runes to know. So he shed the Jarl and became Rig himself. So that idea of us cultivating these gifts that we have, of beginning to understand the runes, of embracing our ancestry, of staying focused on the midmost way and not being distracted to the left or to the right, and moving forward in life is what allows us to enter to join the divine at the feast at their table. And this whole idea in Riggs Thula, it works on so many levels. But in this day and age, where we are and what we're challenged with and what we're faced with, 
This is the kind of interpretation that allows us to demonstrate, to record, to list a long litany of success that makes the ideas of assailing our faith almost impossible. The church, all these other organizations get away with absolute murder in no uncertain terms. And yet because they have faith and people follow this myth, their own idea of purpose, guidance, and direction, it's still allowed to exist. And we're sitting here, distracted over here, distracted over there, failing to embrace the midmost way. We understand we ought to be hanging on to our ancestral heritage. And now all of a sudden the runes are here, but we're not really sure because we keep getting focused over here, over there. We have got to refocus our efforts, redouble who and what we think we are, focus on the runes, understand these language of the birds, use it to help the people around us who are seeking, who need to be comforted, who deal with sorrow, who are dealing with pain, and use it to move ourselves forward and this faith. The answers to how to move this faith into something greater than what we can even begin to imagine reside right there in the Rig Stula. That we might earn the right to be called Rig ourselves. The focus of our thoughts, our thoughts create our reality, and it's right there in an age-old tale. What kind of thought and reality are you going to create? Are you going to create one where your children lived and are happy? Or are we going to continue to brandish spears and swords at windmills? The halls of Dan and Damp are noble, greater their wealth than thou hast gained. Good are they at guiding the kill, trying of weapons and giving of wounds. We don't always need to seek out an enemy. But what we do need to figure out is how we can join the divine at that table. So as you go through the rest of this weekend, think about how you're using the ideas that are contained in this faith, this great wisdom. Do we have the right to seek out and call ourselves rig? Are we using this faith to move our people forward? Or are we simply seeking out this argument over here or that argument over there to prove how right we are so people might pay attention to us? That time is long past. Now it's time to cultivate a faith. No matter what anyone says, doesn't matter if they like it or dislike it, if we continue to focus on what it says in the Rig Thula, we're going to move forward. And with that, I appreciate your time. I'm sorry it was so late this evening, but... Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope, uh, I hope it uh, yields benefits in your lives. And uh, in doing so, maybe it'll yield a benefit in the lives of your children and your grandchildren. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thanks, Brian. I look forward to re-watching it. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, Melissa. I'm trying to figure out how to stop it on here. I don't know how to work it. I'm trying to figure out how to back out of it myself. <laughs> oh my god! Oh, there we go. There we go. Bye, guys. Bye.